Hello, and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to move your parish from maintenance to mission. I get to be in studio today with two awesome guys. I'm here with Ron Huntley from the Divine Renovation team. Good to hey, see Dan. you, buddy. And I'm also here with a, an occasional guest that comes on as a co-host. I'm with you, Matt Vaughn from St. Benedict Parish. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How you doing, man? I'm doing really good. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. It's Thanks really, for having me. It's, uh, I understand you're actually a little more busy these days. Uh, yes, that's true. A little yeah. busier. Um, we had a... Uh, uh, a transition with uh, with our teams at St. Benedict. Um, yeah. So essentially, we used to have, without going into too much detail, we used to have a communications team, then we had an operations team, um, and then uh, I think you guys took our, uh, our I don't know what the title was, but the operations, operations guy. We took guy, a director right? of operations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We Rob stuck with, that's Rob McDowell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Rob. He's awesome. So yeah, that led to a little bit of- Thanks for forming him so well for us. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had a lot to do with it. <laughs> Ask Rob, yeah he, would, yeah, he would say exactly that. Um, yeah, so we, uh, so we had to kind of figure things out, which was good. I think it's a good time. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of different transitions mm -hmm. over the last year with some, with some hiring as well. And so, uh, yeah, there was decided that we bring the communications team and the operations team together, yep. um, that, uh, Kate Robinson, who has been on here a few times, uh, that she would lead that team. Uh, we got to rename it, which was fun. So we're now officially the mission support team, um, which is, which is good. Cause we're, we're all about supporting the mission and, um, we like that. I think that's, that fits us really well. And uh, so we've come together very well. And so that also means that since Kate is leading that, instead of being the director of communications, she's the team lead for that. And now I am the sole person who is running communications. So I don't know if this counts as a promotion or if it's just they've given you more work and responsibility. But either way, I'm excited for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's still early days. Like we're still figuring yeah. things out. Um, so it, it's good. I'm feeling things out. People are being patient, which I think is crucial. And that's really important <laughs> that, um, you know, I'm still being allowed to, to, to crawl a little bit before I can walk, before I can run. So it's good. And, I, and, and with our team leads, the culture we have at St. Benedict anyway is that, um, you know, we can talk to our team leads all the time. We can feed off each other. And it really helps that my team lead has the job I currently have. <laughs> you know, she has that experience. <laughs> she had so that experience. She yeah, 100% sure. gets it. She has, uh, I mean, she formed so much. Uh, of what we do communication wise at the parish anyway. Yeah. And so um, she's, she's been there before she's had the tough conversations with people. Yeah. Um, so it's been good. And so I'm looking forward to it. So Ron, with the yeah. parishes you work with uh, and the ones that you coach in the, in the divine innovation network, uh, are they all a pluses in communications? Are they struggling? What, what, what's your sense of it? Well, I don't even think St. Benedict is an A-plus in communication, if okay, we were wow. honest. <laughs> <laughs> don't make him leave the podcast. <laughs> but like a B, B plus. It's, 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 <laughs> it's so hard. Like, communications yeah, is, is complicated. It? We have so many people. Like, most churches, bigger churches, like we're 1,400. I know there's lots of listeners that are much bigger than that, plenty that are smaller as well. But, you know, there's so many different types of activities going on in any given week or month, and so many people... You know, we've always done things a particular way. And so shifting how we communicate, because let's face it, the world has shifted. Mm, <laughs> how the yeah. world communicates is totally different. And and yet for most churches, they're still older. Uh, you know, the, the people that go are older. And so they not, don't necessarily adjust as easily to new modes of communication. And so it's really hard. Like, so there's so many things going on. And, and not just the church, think about the world itself is so busy. People are so busy, so much coming at us all the time. And so getting creative around how we communicate so that we actually get through, get the messages through to the, the, the groups of people that we're trying to speak to is hard. And so I don't know anybody that's an A plus in communication in any of the, any of the co in churches that we coach. Um, because it's so complicated and so hard. And, and if you think about at a church, most churches are under-resourced anyway, you yeah. know, when it comes to staff and, and technology and tools. And, and so it takes a lot of creativity, a lot of energy, um, and resourcefulness. And it, but it's so important, right? It's important to do as well as we possibly can. Well, it's one of the things that, that leads to a lot of frustration for, for parishioners mm. uh, sometimes too. And so... You know, to get it right is important, but it's also really difficult. And so I just love what Kate and Matt and the team at St. Benedict are doing because they're really leading the way in innovating and trying to implement a vision, have a vision for starters. Most people don't, yeah. but to have a vision for communication and then take those risks and innovate to try to bring about new realities uh, to support the mission. I just think it's awesome, but it's not easy. So Matt, you're here. So let's take advantage of the fact you're sure. here. Let me help us understand. So what are some of the things that you think are really working well around communications and where are some of the areas you think you still need to grow? I think that um, we've had, we had some recent um, improvements to our, um, the, 
physical, like to the building. Essentially, we, we got new projectors at Mass. And so um, mm. that's good for things like announcements, uh, even things for like the homilies. See, it's interesting because communications is, uh, it can be so, it can be so big. It can be like, because honestly, like the priest is communicating when he gets the homily, right? Like that's the, like, if you can just start there and you say your parish is always communicating something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even what you're doing during the liturgy, even, you know, and I'm thinking specifically of weekend announcements because we write those, we do the slides for them. Um, you know, th- those are um, such big pieces and they really do matter. And I think that um, people kind of, maybe, maybe people don't recognize how big those are. Yep. Uh, and so we reckon, we have, have known that for a little while. And uh, so to have an upgrade with a projector is great because it's like, oh great, now people can see everything that we, that we have. It was actually, it actually fits for uh, the room that we have as well, for the lighting. Uh, so that's been, um, that's been a big improvement, uh, I would say. Um, I think that um, we have a pretty good system week to week with, um, the overview, which is um, kind of replaced the parish bulletin. So instead of it being a you know, like a four page document, or I, I think Kate, yeah, so there's no printed page. bulletin. Like, uh, this not, to a lot of parishes, no. that, that would be novel. It's like, oh, so there's no printed exactly. four page bulletin that people get after Sunday? So no. the overview is essentially um, it's so like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper turned sideways, cut in half. It has to fit on there. So it's like four or five things. Um, now, sometimes I cheat that because I have to, because things just, it gets crazy. It's, it's just the fall. Um, and now we do print out some of those. So if people literally don't have a computer, um, that's kind of been the thing that we did. Okay, we're not going to have a bulletin, but if you if you need to have this, uh, you can do that. I think I print out probably less than 60 of those a week. And in a parish that size, it's a, it's a small number, but um, the, the digital copy goes out uh, every um, every week. And then once a month, including this past weekend, um, the Benedictus comes out, which is our monthly magazine, which is mm-hmm. um, 16 pages, color, glossy, goes to a printer, we have writers, we have a photographer, we do some graphic design on there. Um, and so that's a bit more, and, and that's not, you know, you're not reading articles about the, the next bake sale. It's about uh, lives being changed. Mm. Um, and those are the kind of the big, those are the big kind of weekly things. So someone's so, Cause you're talking yeah. about uh, the Benedictus and we don't actually yeah. have one here on set to show. If, if someone Should wanted to see one. the Benedictus, is there a way, like if I'm, if I'm listening to the podcast and I want it, what's a Benedictus and what does it look like? What, stories, what do you mean stories? Yeah. How do I find out? Yes, yeah, so go to stbenedict.ca yeah. and on the uh, the bar there, there's a there's a tab called media. If you go over that, there's it says, I think it's watch, read, listen. So we go to read because it's a book or a magazine, I guess it's a printed word. Uh, you can go there, you can see the, the latest Benedictus that just came yeah. out, it's right at the top of that page. And then we have our whole archive. Yeah. So you can see all the way down, which is great. And, and something that could be really useful, uh, especially for your viewers and listeners would be uh, just to read uh, yeah. what Father Simon, what Father James, when he was pastor, what they would write month to month, because they've, they both had, uh, they both have like a, a pastor's article at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really interesting to see how they use that to tr- what they try to communicate, because um, you know, it's not something, they're not gonna kind of regurgitate a homily in there. They're going to talk about um, change to the parish. They're going to talk about these kind of these vision things. That they well, they're doing that in communication with you guys, yeah. like as a as an entire staff. Yeah, you yeah. guys are guiding them in terms of what do we need to communicate. I'm sending things what out to you, them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so it's a team approach. It's not like, hey, what great book has the pastor read, and or what's the, his latest prayer revelation, yeah. and what's he speaking? It's, in the, it's very specific. It's yeah. very intentional. Everything they do. And in fact, I'd even encourage our listeners to sign up because you can sign up yeah. for the weekly overview, you don't have to go to St. Benedict to get the Benedictus in the overview. So sign up and have it coming into your So one of the things you you mentioned, Matt, was uh, the screens at St. Benedict. I got new projectors. Those are awesome, by the way. I love the new projectors uh, because you can actually see them. The other ones were really kind of dimming as they aged. We have a lot of natural light in the church and it was a big issue competing with that natural light. And so, but what strikes me about projectors is that mm. for, for a lot of churches, they're still novel. And we were just in, in Chicago for the Renew My Church conference. And what did they have in Chicago? They had projectors. So we did mass in this, so it's a big convention center, right? There's 2,700 odd people there. Mm. And we did mass there. Uh, there was, uh, the, the conference itself was held in this giant room. And there were projectors along with several screens given the, the size of it. Mm. And uh, it, what, what struck me reading some of the um, the feedback was that People identified it as a new way to engage in mass, and I thought, oh right. So for so many, because I've become so used to it at St. Benedict Parish, uh, but for so many, using projectors is is, is sort of it's new and novel. Uh, but what was your experience of, of that in Chicago, Ron? Well, I thought they did an amazing job. Like hats off to Father Peter and Marco and their entire team. They just oh. they just went above and beyond to really provide an amazing experience for the people in their diocese. I just couldn't be more proud of them. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because when the whole topic of screen comes up, some people, it's just so offensive to them. Like, right. it, they just think, how dare you? Like, our our sacred liturgy and the space is so important and beautiful. And clearly, a 
convention room, not quite the case. Not as but, beautiful. But, 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 but why do we do screens? Like, we have to remember the why. It's, you know, if we're self-referential and inward focused, then yeah, everybody knows the prayers. Everybody knows the, where to go in the Catholic Book of Worship 3 and, and all, all those other things. But if you're actually a church that's reaching out, people are going to be coming to your church and they don't know how to participate. They don't know the prayers. And to have them up on the screen, have the words up on the screen, it makes it easy. It reduces their anxiety. It makes it easier for them to participate. And so... If, if, if the, even the word screens makes you think about shutting off this podcast, I just ask you, who, what's your heart oriented? Where's your heart oriented? To those outside or those inside? Because it can be both. And if it's going to be both, we need to think about ways. Yeah. I just, can, I just, can I just get in real quick? Because I got, I got to share because uh, there's a guy who's in, in, who's in my connect group. And uh, like screens made such a big impact on him because he was not, didn't go to a church, had nothing to do with it, um, was dating a girl. She took him to a different church. Um, and it was... It was confusing for him. He just didn't know. It was a, kind of the classic Catholic thing, when to sit, when to stand, that whole thing. And uh, so he was kind of, it was, it was tough on him. And so he asked her, can we, is there any other church we can go to that maybe fits a little bit better? And she, should, she said, sure. Um, I think she do Father James a little bit. And so they went to St. Benedict. And the, the screens made such a big difference because he was like, I know what they're saying. I know why they're mm-hmm. saying it. Uh, and I mean, just to be able to engage with mass like that, like he just, he didn't know. Um, and you know, it just kind of, it made such a big difference. Like, yeah. and, and I just, I really hope people understand that. I hope that people get that. Like, it's no, like this is such a way in for people. And if you do them right, I was actually, I was in a church in, in PEI over the summer and they use their slides. Uh, they had a projector mask. They use them very well. You know, nice. when they, when they use uh, graphics or images, it fit even with their space and everything like that. Like, and they were, they were being a bit more, um, uh, I would say kind of maybe reserved with them. Like we're a little bit, you know, we do a bit more graphic wise, um, at St. Benedict, but uh, they did such a good job. And I really think that it's, it's we such had, a good time. We had uh, AJ, come on, Pastor AJ, mm-hmm. right, from Deepwater Church. So Wesleyan pastor, and he, uh, just a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, and he shared, of course, that um, he comes to, to St. Benedict on occasion, he visits and he goes to other churches, in part because he wants to get that experience of what's it like to be someone who doesn't know what you're supposed to be doing and, and then is, is trying to struggle in terms of what the norms are in this mm-hmm. given space. And, you know, what I loved about and what I really appreciated about um, what happened at the Renew My Church conference in Chicago was... They, they did the team, Father Peter and the whole team in the, in the diocese that worked on that conference, they worked so hard to make sure that they were incorporating all the cultures and they've got so many languages. Oh my God. So there's like Polish and Spanish. So and cool. Honestly, had, it was the first time in a while that I've been at a Catholic service where I'm like, I have no idea what, what people are saying because they're speaking Polish. Like, and, and if it hadn't been for those screens, like I, I wouldn't even, like, what are we doing? What's going on? And so there was actually, for me, for the first time in a long time, I found, I found comfort and solace in giant screens Good because, point. you know, all of a sudden people are, are praying in Polish. I don't know what exactly they're praying, but I can follow because it's in Polish, it's in English beneath it, so I understand. It was, it was so great and so much more engaging for me. It's true, and it was really fun, too, because when we were singing the responses to the prayers and stuff, and they were in three different languages. <laughs> Because you sing it so many times, you actually start to get good at it. You start singing in Polish. It was so fun. (laughs) But how could I participate? Well, because there was screens. Because there was a screen. So, you know, that's a really good point. And so, you know, screens, to Matt's point, is another form of communication. You know, the conference in Chicago really was terrific. And, you know, to bring so many different ethnic communities together... Uh, which is a part of their experience, but boy, they're not alone. You know, I went from Chicago down to Orange County, That's California. Right. I haven't heard about this trip. What happened there? And very similar. Like they have to figure out how do we do church? How do we live out our Catholic experience in a way that's fruitful? when we have so many ethnic communities to consider, and what does that look like? I mean, they're, that's really good questions. It's down the street from St. Benedict. They're building a Our Lady of Lebanon, uh, or is that what it's called, Our Lady of Lebanon? I think so. It's a Maronite church. Maronite church, yeah. yeah. Uh, And and so that's mostly Lebanese people. And and so we're, we're, you know, bishops and and priests are trying to figure out how do we do this? And it's challenging. I I don't know that we have the perfect answer. I know that at St. Benedict, we too have all kinds of subsets of ethnic cultures within the, the community. And so... They're trying to wrestle with that in Orange County as well. And I, my sense yeah. is that you're driving to the same thing that the Renew My Church conference was driving to, the same sense that that what, what Orange County, but it's, it's to try and get to the underlying why. I mean, like the screens are just a tactic, right? Mm. But it's, it's to understand why are we trying to do some of these things. And then if you understand the why, then I think some of those tactics might that some people might find offensive or not traditional or whatever it is, mm. you know, then, then suddenly you can accept them. Well, and it's a matter of like, you know, Gary Newhoff said, are you married to your methods? 
or are you married to your mission? And if you're married to your mission, you'll innovate to find new ways to be fruitful. But if you're married to your methods, you're already dying. And, you know, again, a tweet that Father James put out there, religious people have preferences, missionary people have stories. And if when we focus, and this is my message to, to people, is we need to focus on mission. Because if we're focusing on your ethnic preferences or whatever that looks like, then it's all about you. And that is never going to be what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to have a heart of the Father, to look out for that one sheep that's gone astray. And boy, when we stop doing that, we get inward focus, and, and that's death to the church. And it's death to you spiritually, personally, too. Like, when I get inward focus, because I have to wrestle with this up and down, too. When I get inward focus, my spirituality, my prayer life shrinks. Yeah, and that's how it works in relationships, right? Once you're in a relationship with someone, you say, hey, what's in this for me, right? Whether it's a marriage or friendship or anything like that. Gosh, that's death for it, right? It's same death. with the relationship with God, same with the relationship at a church with other people. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I think the, the heart of what we're doing, if we get this right, is we get everyone focused on mission. No matter what color their skin is, no matter what language they speak, if you're in a parish, that whole parish needs to be focused on mission. On that note, I want us to just take a pause because we've got Andre Renier here from Catholic Christian Outreach. So I'm excited to bring him on so we can talk a bit about CCO and evangelization. So we will be right back. When we say culture, we're talking about the organizational culture. What is what is normative? What is what is even sometimes unconsciously so? And we have to unmask culture. We have to be able to name it the culture of our parishes and then lean into it to change the culture. Culture is shaped by what you celebrate. And if you want to see a culture of evangelization and discipleship begin to take root in your parish, you need to begin to celebrate these stories of people who have encountered Jesus and had their lives changed. It is such a joy to have you in studio with us, Andre. You, you, you've been a, a, an evangelizer for, for, for a long time in all sorts of different ways, working with Catholic Christian outreach. In fact, not just working with them, but founding them. So welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. And uh, can, you, can you help us? Because I know not everybody would be familiar with CCO. Our, we have listeners all over the world. Why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about what CCO is? Well, it's a, it's a university student movement that started 30 years ago, my wife and I. We started when we were five years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a movement um, that is committed to evangelization on university campuses. Mm -hmm. And we all know the number, the great number, the millions upon millions of our young people who go to university and just walk away from the church so easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not leaving because they have convictions against the church. They just don't have a heart for it. They haven't been captured yes. by it. And so what we wanted to do was to, to intervene, to, to chase after them, not allow hope that they would chase after us someday. So we went after them aggressively, searching them out. Once we found them, we presented the gospel in a clear and simple way so that they could understand and then you know, respond appropriately to it and bring about this conversion of heart. And then once they had this conversion, this transformation, uh, a love for Jesus and a love for the church, then we built them up um, as missionary disciples that we wanted them to become leaders, to go get their peers and, and to reach out to them and do the same thing, evangelize them, build them up, and then send them out. And so, we, yeah, we've been doing that for 30 years. Um, and you've got, you've got uh, missionaries on campuses, uh, certainly all across this country, right? Yeah, we have right now, yeah, I think we're in 16 universities across Canada. We're presently in Uganda. We have seven universities there we're working with. But we're also in communication with um, universities um, in different parts of the world, uh, in Mexico, and there's a, a, a group doing some work uh, similar to CCO in Australia. Anyway, different parts of the world um, that people are trying to engage with the material and methodology. And I've, I've met some of uh, the CCO missionaries over the years. Uh, and some of them are pretty good. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if all of them are, but at least one or two is. And so, so, so Matt, I, uh, am I right in understanding that you used to have some connection to CCO? Yeah, no, I wasn't a, a campus missionary because they're amazing people that I, I didn't do that. But I was a, a student uh, at university uh, at Dalhousie in Halifax. And uh, I was involved with CCO throughout my whole time there. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was it was like a formative part of my university experience. I feel like I learned more 
being involved with CCO than I did with a lot of my degrees, I would say in a lot of ways. Um, and it was just such an important time. Uh, you know, people I met there are lifelong friends. They're people who are still doing this, which I think is, is, is amazing is there's mm -hmm. still people who, uh, you know, five, uh, maybe close to 10 years later, people are still, uh, reaching out to people. Some of them still work at university campuses. If they don't, they're still, they still have a missionary heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to, to think about that and to, to look back on that because I mean, CCO was like my, like, like the, formative experience in university. And I have to say it was also the formative experience of being, having a missionary heart. You know, I'm in a parish now where that's the norm. And uh, the fact that I find that normal and that I didn't have to really learn that is because I was involved in CCO. I mean, it's, it's such a crucial part of that. Can I ask you a question? Uh, he uses the word a missionary heart. What do you actually mean by a missionary heart? Because that's a, a statement a lot yeah, of people are using. It's a throwaway using. term, but there's exactly a missionary yeah. heart. What is a missionary heart in your opinion? Hey, we're asking you the questions here, Andre. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I'm just testing you. No, no, I'm sorry. Testing you. Of course, yeah, no, no. Uh, when you have a heart for mission, when, when, uh, like to, to what Ron said earlier uh, in, in the podcast, just about being self referential and caring about yourself. Uh, you know, to have a missionary heart is when you say, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the main player at the church. I'm not mm. the main person who needs to be there. Uh, it's not about me. Uh, and that's also not what Jesus wanted us to do. Like, like we have a mission. Jesus gave us a mission. And to take that on uh, is to kind of to, um, isn't, that's something I think Father James says about a conversion to uh, the mission as well, not just conversion mm -hmm. to Jesus, but a conversion to mission. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that, that came. Can I, can I, can I do something? You wrote a book, Andre, and I've got a copy of it here and I've been <laughs> reading your book and it's fabulous. And, and, and I've got, mine's all marked up with highlighters and such. By the way, the name of the book is, is clear and simple, how to have conversations that lead to conversion. It's a really good book. Yeah. It's, it's a tight read too. But um, uh, one of the sections that in your book that really struck me is actually Exactly when um, when you write like Catholics are going to Catholics will often struggle with understanding what is evangelization and can I, can I just read a couple sentences from the yeah, you can read the, the whole book if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cheap way to do the audio book so, actually. So, yeah, so the context the context is you know you're saying Catholics are going to struggle with what is evangelization and then you then you go on to say until there is clarity of meaning and practice and a well defined vocabulary the essentials of evangelization will for the most part be limited to new movements and communities in the church those that have devoted themselves in the clearest terms to the new evangelization. For the rest of the church, evangelization will remain primarily a subject of spiritual chatter and sentiment. I thought, oh my gosh, like, yes, is that not exactly what we see in parishes? Those that don't understand what evangelization is, it becomes just sort of like, you know, yeah, yeah, we, we do the new evangelization. We've got- the Buzzword. Like, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. So I, I got so excited because I'm like, it echoed so strongly. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> You're getting me all fired up too. <laughs> but that's just, but isn't that true? Like, so, so how do we help parishes? How do we help people? How do we help Catholics understand what evangelization is? Well, I asked the question, mm -hmm. so what do you be, mean by mission? By the way, you did a fairly good job, but actually Fairly. I still don't know what he meant by mission. Um, Really, Ron, you did a great job of explaining mission. Mission, when we're talking about evangelical mission, we're talking about, yes, not being self-referential, being, you know, going to the peripheries with the message of the gospel, Jesus Christ. When we're talking about mission, we're talking about making Jesus known to those who do not know him or do not know him well enough. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, you know, and, and by the way, everyone would agree with that statement. They would say amen to that. But I asked wow. the question, what do you mean by evangelization? It becomes very, very um, nebulous and kind of confusing and, and kind of uh, wandering in different directions. We need clarity on, on this topic if evangelization is going to take hold. But Audrey, see, here's, here's where I find that we, we often run into to sort of a a conflict of understanding in the sense that, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. But of course it, I am. I wrote a book on yeah, it. Yeah. It's a, it's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing where I, where, what I see, you're absolutely right. And here's how we misunderstand it. We often think that if I just teach you about Jesus, that's the same as you knowing about Jesus. And they're not the same things, are they? Well, yes. Um, in the book, I, I, um, I try to um, bring uh, to, I, I, able to actualize what the church has said, mm -hmm. the heart, the mind of the church. I want to put it into words or explain it so that the average person could understand what the church really means by evangelization. So answering your question, at the heart of evangelization is an encounter with Jesus Christ, an encounter that changes your life. Well, again, everyone is going to agree with that. Yeah, that's what we want. 
but I ask the questions, how does that happen? And it becomes vague and, and, and mm. confusing. There's no clarity and there's no uh, simplicity to it. So what happens often in evangelization is that we, we depend on the sage from the stage. Let's, let's get the most gifted evangelist out there and let's pay him big money to come to a conference and to evangelize everyone we know. Well, one, the people we know don't come to these conferences, we do. Um, and so we're just inspired by this evangelist. But what should be really happening, if there's clarity, if, if there's a simplicity to it, the average Catholic, the one who's had an encounter with Jesus Christ, can actually become the evangelist yep. in a coffee shop with a family member, a friend, a parishioner, somebody that you're, you have just met on the bus if, if you know, that opportunity makes itself available to you. Mm. And so what we wanted to do is demystify the, the idea of, um, of evangelization and conversion, bring what the church has taught us um, to a place where each of us can embrace it. So I, I've kind of broke it up in three I'm going a little, do you have any questions? Uh, <laughs> keep keep going. Going. Do you have a three-step process? Yeah, I do, I do, yes. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for that question. In all seriousness, you, you, CCO is, uh, you know, you've been on campus for 30 years? Yeah, 30 years. 20, yeah. 29, 20, 30, 50, 30, 50 30 years, years, 50 30 years, years, but they, it's spanned over 30, 30 years. Period. No, it's 30, 30 years. years. It's amazing, right? Yeah. So you must, uh, CCO as a ministry must have, have reached so many people over those years with the gospel and, and actually brought people into relationship with Jesus. How, how is it working? How is that happening on campuses? What does that look like? Well, we're talking more theoretical here. Uh, you know, there's no, no, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, evangelization, if it is what it, it's supposed to do, it's supposed to change lives. And so that's, that's why 30 years later, we're still engaged. Uh, we're not dealing with theory here or a, a wishful thinking from the very first um, day that we we're on campus, we began to see the Holy Spirit work in power when the gospel in, in Romans chapter one, it says that the gospel has power and has power to change lives. And so that what's, that's what we've seen over the last 30 years when the kerygma, the church has talked so much about the initial proclamation it's, it's especially around the, the Synod on the New Evangelization in 2012, it made so many documents that the instrumental labors and then the propositions after the Synod that they're sending to the Pope saying, okay, this is what evangelization is. It is steeped in great evangelical language that changes lives, um, could change, potentially change lives, but they're just stored away somewhere in the archives for nobody to read other than maybe a theologian once in a while. But I read it and I'm no theologian and I saw um, treasures there, mm. you know? And what, what I saw was the church said, initial proclamation is central to evangelization. The kerygma, we need to understand the kerygma. Now, what is that? And what we found is that the kerygma is not just this big theological kind of understanding of who Jesus is and, you know, historically, you know, his impact and, you know, the sacraments, which are all very important. But the kerygma is a simple presentation of who Christ is and what he's done for us so that we, our lives can be changed by him. Oh, yeah. And so if that's the case, then the church has invited us to come up with a systematic presentation of that kerygma so that every parish, every parishioner can actually engage in it. And so as a movement, that's what we did early on, is we made the gospel or the kerygma, Jesus, um, we presented in such a clear and simple way. And in the book, it actually talks about how, you know, you can share why Jesus, you know, the, the relationship, what Jesus did to restore the relationship and how we can respond. And so I would, I would share that with them. And we've seen this many times. You go, okay, now I recognize what, how Jesus uh, bridges a relationship, meaning makes you know, my broken relationship with God restored. I know it just seems very simple language, mm. but it is a simple concept, repenting. And that's kind of at the heart of the Christian message and why Jesus came uh, to take our sins um, upon him 
With CCO, your approach on campus, as I understand it, now, I didn't, where, where I went to university in Canada, there was no CCO on campus, by the way, you really should put it on yeah. more campuses. Uh, so, <laughs> so, like, so my encounter of CCO actually happened after I'd graduated and I started meeting all sorts of people uh, from CCO and, and they, they all had a wonderful impact in my life. But on campus, as I understand it, uh, CCO really, it, it becomes sort of one person trying to reach one person. Is that, is that how that looks? Like what happens on campuses? How does this work? Does it work? Well, no, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no it, it works um, because at the very heart of the movement is relationship. And uh, again, God is relationship. If, if we're going to communicate this relationship that God wants to have with us, we actually have to be in relationship with the people. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of, um, um, you know, there's structural activity that happens to make relationship possible. For example, we build the relationship by you know, setting up a table in the public area. And as people go by, we give them free food and enter into a conversation with the them. University campuses giving away free food? Yes. That's a winning food. strategy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Strategy. Like, like, for example, yeah. for example, um, in this year alone, we've had 2,400 people across Canada, brand new people, um, uh, sign up, not only their name and phone number, but their schedule. 2,400 people. Like their class schedule? Their class schedule really? saying, you have access to us. Wow. 2,400 new people. And out of those 2,400, I would say about 2,000 of them are non-practicing. Wow. But that, getting their schedule came in the context of a relationship, yeah. a, a conversation. We stopped and we said, here we are, you know, here, here's who I am. But we don't, we take it a little further. We get those 2,400 schedules their name and phone number, we call every single one of them and set up an appointment to meet each and every one of them. And that meeting could be between five to, to one hour. And so this is your, your missionaries on campus? They're the ones so who are- students too. So this is students. So it's the missionaries and, and then students. Help. So, so people understand because even I don't. So what does the structure look like on a campus? Like take Dalhousie, you're the university you went to, yeah. Matt. What does it look like? You've got a missionary in We charge? have four there... missionaries, three to four missionaries. And then we would- those missionaries are responsible for building up leaders, student leaders, yep. uh, that would do exactly what we're tending to do. For example, uh, sitting at the table and you know running down these yep. people who are walking by, and then making the phone call and and setting up a meeting with these um, these potential uh, wandering sheep, mm -hmm. um, and sit down with them. And in that sit down meeting, we talk to them about what CCO is and what we have to offer and, you know, are they interested in, in, you know, looking at an opportunity, considering an opportunity to just look at who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then so we how, invite them to- a, How in the world do you form or find these people? What does that look like? What, how we what? How do you form or find these people? You've got four missionaries at, at a given campus and then student leaders. How, where are these people coming from? They're walking by. They're walking by. They're, they're, they're walking by. They're not interested. They're not searching out God. We search them out. And we got in front of them and we, like I said, we just said, hi, you, you want some free <laughs> food? You know, uh, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your faith. Well, we don't really have faith. Would you be interested? Yes, we, we train. Uh, the conversation is, is a natural conversation. And after about five, 10 minutes, uh, they say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. And like I said, these are tell wonderful. Tell your topics. faith is a great question, isn't it? Yeah. You know, because we don't have to go to church to have faith. And so, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people, you know, be able, if they don't have any, I'm sure they're quite comfortable saying, I don't have any. But if they have some experience, I'm sure they're happy to be able to say, yeah, you know, this is where I was. And, you know, and so yeah. what a great question to ask. It's non judgmental. It's just yeah. tell me about it. Well, <laughs> it's well, I, a great I, way to enter into a conversation. Yeah. I would say at the, at the, the most important um, disposition we should take as missionaries is we are more concerned about where they are at rather than us telling them where we're at. Mm. So if we know where they're at, then we could speak to them about what areas that they might you know, be questioning or struggling with. Right. But if I come to them, that's been the, the mode of operation in the church is that we impose what we know, all the theology and all you know, the great saints and the thinking and the heart and the structure of the church. And we, we're hoping that they'll be impressed by how impressive we are. Um, but they don't even understand anything that we're saying. Most right. of the time, they're just confused or turned off by what we're saying. So 
asking the questions, tell me about your faith or tell me about your experience is an, a, a powerful kind of question that'll find out a lot more of how I am to uh, work with you than if I just imposed it upon you. And culturally, at least here in North America, most people would know of Jesus, right? Like, so, so at least on the university campus, people know of Jesus. They know of Christianity. They know of Catholicism. Uh, but most, even, frankly, even Catholics might not know who Jesus actually is. And, and they might not have had an encounter of him. And they might not really understand a lot of, of uh, what sort of the nuggets of our faith are. And so you're, you're opening the door for that conversation to start. Well, you know, I, I had the opportunity at the University of Ottawa um, to have access to the College of Education, all those students studying to become ca- uh, teachers in the Catholic school system. So we had access to them all. Mm. And these were the quintessential Catholic, meaning they, they weren't practicing. But I would have a classroom of 100 potential teachers. 99% of them, you know, are turned off. But we take them uh, through our um, faith study series of discovery, which is looking at who Jesus is. Um, And not only who Jesus is, but what he's done for us. But what I discovered there um, is about, I would say, 90% of our people, not only the the quintessential Catholic, but the, the practicing Catholic, the one that goes to Mass on Sunday, that 90% of our people do not believe in the divinity of Christ. So, so let me just get this straight, Andre. So you're saying a room full of people that have gone to the Catholic schools? Yeah, and, they they're, they're in the Catholic. and they want to teach Catholic, in the Catholic. And they want to teach in the Catholic schools, those people. So what you're saying to me is we are doing church in North America in ways where people don't know flipping Jesus. But yeah. And we keep doing it over and over again, and we think that's okay. Holy man, I'm losing my mind right now. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, my I heart why is Catholic broken. Catholic schools aren't as effective at making disciples. Well, but you know, I wouldn't even blame the Catholic school. I mean, uh, I'm the not prob- blaming it. No, no. Schools, uh, w- but what I'm, I'm saying, saying is that stop. the teachers only know what the church has taught them. <laughs> And so it's uh, this Catholic school is only, you know, a product of what's happening, you know, in the church. They, they, they are, you know, the fruit of, of our labors. Oh. The, I think, um, I believe that the church has failed to see evangelization or mission as our primary responsibility. And if we've forgotten that mission or evangelization is our primary um, yeah. responsibility, then you can see where Jesus becomes kind of secondary. And, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody. So well said, Andre. Yep. And right now, um, because of all the scandals and all the confusion, institution and, and the hierarchy, and it, everybody's confused and, and disappointed and hurt. This is a glorious moment mm-hmm. for the church because now the primary, listen to this, the primary message, the most important message is no longer going to be, and I love the institution, by the way, no longer be the institution and all its kind of doctrines and devotions. I love the doctrine and devotion, but it is going to be Jesus. Jesus is going to become the primary message because Jesus hasn't been stained. He's still credible. He's still credible. And so the opportunity for us is actually, and this is what the book is trying to communicate, let's make sure that we're clear on Jesus. Mm. Let's make sure that we're clear on Jesus, but not only clear on Jesus, but clear on how to communicate uh, Jesus to another person in a coffee shop, but not only just clear on communicating Jesus to somebody in a coffee shop, but clear on how to inviting them into a relationship with Jesus Christ in a coffee shop. Meaning the whole process of evangelization, invitation, and conversion. Mm-hmm. And, you're, and what I love about what you guys do is it doesn't stop there. There's accompaniment. Like you guys, you got to develop and maintain those relationships when you disciple people and bring them into mission. Like it doesn't stop at that conversion point for you guys. And I just want to say to Andre, like, thank you so much for everything you do. Like the fact that you're going on campuses and seeking out our kids, like, it's so important what you're doing. Um, and it, it, 
It, it really is. It's, it's unbelievable that somebody's doing that because these people, these poor young people, there is not much life on campus. My son plays hockey in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, and he's in Quebec City. And the lack of faith is so dismal that even a young man like that, born and raised, going to you know St. Benedict Parish, just on fire with Steubenville and everything else, it's, it's an attack on your faith when you have no support, no peers, nobody journeying with you and calling you to greatness. Um, and the fact that you're doing this, you know, 30 years later and raising up this army of people, not only in Canada, but worldwide. Thank you. It's yeah. so important what you do. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, what you guys are doing uh, with divine renovation is a beautiful thing also, but it just tells me uh, that the spirit uh, is doing something incredible in the church today. I mean, you know, we're, we're actually, it's becoming pretty common. Uh, a, a conversation that's happening, an evangelical conversation that's happening here, with Divine Renovation or other movements doing the same thing, talking about real evangelization. And we're thinking, oh, yeah, that's normal. That's <laughs> acceptable. Five years ago, this conversation would not have happened in the mainstream. Yeah. This would have been, you know, a few movements on the side kind of having this internal conversation saying, wow, can you believe it? Oh, and, and feeling the resistance of uh, the, the church um, as a whole. But now it seems uh, and the Holy Spirit is, is allowing this conversation now to seep into the parish, which is you know, essential to the renewal of the this world. This is what I loved. So for me, one of the real eye-openers in your book was... I, you know, because it does go back. It, it, you do tell the story of some, you do tell stories from the very early days of, of CCO. Uh, so 30 odd years ago and 30 odd years ago, I was a lot younger. Uh, I was around. Were you around? I'm not sure if you were around, uh, Matt. Uh, nah, kind of. <laughs> it's around in a dream. But see, I was awfully young at the time and I wouldn't have, of you know, I was just a little kid running around. And so I had no appreciation of what the culture was like. But as I read your book, you, you, you brought to my mind how much things have changed. Like, because you speak about how evangelization, you were you were so, CCO in the Catholic world was so far ahead of the curve in terms of talking about evangelization, trying to bring people into a relationship with Jesus in a way that, you know, it just didn't exist in the Catholic parishes back then. It would have been so rare and so precious. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, that's what why stopped I, you from leaving? Yeah, what stopped you from leaving? You must have been a weirdo in the Catholic context. <laughs> like seriously, because you go to church, you don't talk about Jesus. Well, I, I mean, when the Holy Spirit um, was, uh, my heart was captured by God. I mean, you know, where would I go? You know, who am I to go to? No, uh, uh, leaving wasn't really an option, uh, but it was painful in those early years because, and I don't want to get too much into, you know, the persecution that we experienced back then, but it was difficult. But there was because, persecution? Oh, major. Majorless. Like uh, here are the two major um struggles that people had in the church with us, okay? One is, why are you talking about Jesus so much? Yeah. These are people in the church? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, We still you know, get it, Matt. Like, what, uh, you know, what we but, do, it's still, but, just to be clear, that's not right. <laughs> like, yeah. No, Sorry, no. that was number one. I wanted you to no, say number two uh, as well. No, it's not but I mean, right. It's crazy. But the, we see... Uh, what is it? One percent of Catholics, Sherry Waddell talks about, um, are, are intentional disciples. Well, the product of such thinking is we got one percent of the people that are serious about Jesus, and ninety percent don't even know who he is. That's been the a, the problem in the church the whole time is the identity of Christ. But anyway, that's the first one that uh, we talk about uh, Jesus too much. Uh, the second is um, that uh, um, that we're forcing. Uh, those people that um, we've manipulated those people uh, to actually sharing their experience about Jesus publicly. Hmm. Meaning we are, so we are manipulating know. these young people to share their testimony. They didn't use the word testimony to share um, their emotional experience. So Andre, not only are you making people listen do you tell them about Jesus? But you're asking them to tell you about how Jesus has impacted them. Yeah, no wonder you were you were, you were oppressed. That's a horrible thing. Yeah, but <laughs> but the amazing thing is, okay, here here it is. You know, uh, never never give in to discouragement. Amen. Um, because I, as I look at the last thirty years, I've received more um, rejections mm -hmm. than people jumping on board. I'm in good company. Because Jesus spent his ministry 
<laughs> being rejected. And so I'm in good company, yeah. but it, rejection is a powerful, powerful experience because if you get rejected and, and you give in to discouragement, um, you, you're lost. Mm. And by the way, a lot of people try it once, you know, try, you know, divine renovation. It didn't work the way they would hope and they walk away from it. Still doesn't work the way we hope yeah. either. Just but that, <laughs> we that, that, we, <laughs> that we give in to uh, disappointment, uh, rejection, right. you know, yeah. it didn't go as we planned. But what if you actually got up mm. and started again? Yep. And then you fell again and you got up and you started again. What a testimony um, to living as a disciple of Jesus Christ who, spell, uh, who we know carried the cross, fell three times. Yeah. I mean, you know, what a testimony to that. Isn't that the story of Saint Benedict, though, Ron? Like, isn't say. it? Isn't this that isn't what exactly, happened? That yeah. you know, because from from, I mean, you were on the senior leadership team for for those days when when things were were not going as smooth. I mean, there was a direction, but there was well, there wasn't even a senior leadership team when that started because when we we started talking about Jesus right from soon as we arrived uh, through Alpha, and uh, and then we'd be giving you know, people would be giving testimonies to the women's prayer breakfast and the men's prayer breakfast, and we had there was an uprising of. We don't want to hear people's stories. Uh, we want a nun to come in and tell us what she's doing in Uganda to feed the poor. We don't want to hear about how somebody's life has been changed by Jesus because that's not Catholic. And, and so that's in our church. We had to deal with that. And so I would say, Andre, the, the, the rejection, if the exact same reasons that you were rejected 30 years ago and had to keep getting up and that passion, that conviction you had, that's the same passion and conviction these pastors and leadership teams need to have in Divine Renovation network because uh, they're running into those same issues right now still. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it, this might be normal for us to have this conversation. This conversation still isn't normal. Yeah, it's, it, but it's not become mainstream, level. but it's, it's not normal. Increasingly. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of, uh, people want God and mission to be relevant in their life because they feel the pain of their family members walking away. So they want an answer. We just haven't communicated to them in a clear way for them to be able to engage in it or to understand what they're really engaging in. And that's why clear, I'm not, clear I'm not and promoting no, the book, but clear Read, and simple is really, really important because um, it, uh, the reason I think Alpha is so powerful of a tool is because it's not all that complicated. It's not all that complicated. You know, um, <laughs> you probably have a two page handout on how it works and you just engage, um, you know, and, but it has a plan on multiplication. Well, it's, a, it's the same thing you're doing on campus, right? Let's give out some food. Let's see if we can have a conversation about Jesus. And people. would you like to come back and we'll have some more conversations about Jesus? I mean, that's what's happening at Alpha. It's exactly what you're doing at, at, at a university campus. You know, uh, uh, totally. You know, someone said to me, um, and it was a good friend of mine. He said, Andre, how do you deal with, um, with university students who are not interested in spiritual things. They're not interested in what the church has to say. Um, and so how do you deal with those students? I said, well, before I answer your question, let's look at, at uh, your, your, your thinking or the way you perceive these young people. You think these young people are not interested in what, what we have to offer. The reality is every soul was created for relationship. Every soul, there's nobody in the world in the right mind would say no to love. Well said. No to love, being loved, and better yet, being known and loved by the one who created heaven and earth. Mm. Uh, they would not say no to it. The problem is that is not the message that we're communicating. They're saying no to hierarchy, to, to do's and don'ts, to expectations, to judgment. They're saying to our worldview, there's, they're saying no, they're rejecting- the Experience religion. of liturgy on the weekend. Exactly. That's what they're saying. No. Yeah. So they're not saying no to the fundamental message. So if that's the case, if that's the case, clarity of that is really important. You know, we tried, and by the way, I, I think apologetics is good, but apologetics can become very, very confusing yep. to the, for the listener. It's really exciting for me because I just read the book and I want to throw it all upon you right now. But- the, 
the, um, the ability to able to communicate the message in a clear and simple way so that the, um, that the, the listener or the person I'm engaged with can understand and then go, yeah, I think I want that. Mm. And I've had so many opportunities in the most unique places on planes, uh, you know, a bus conversation, uh, um, conversations in family. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, can I just share one story? Please. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity uh, about two years ago. I was asked by a bishop to come in and do the study days for the priests. And uh, uh, this diocese and the priests in this diocese um, were very uncomfortable with kind of what was taking place in the church, evangelization, Holy Spirit kind of stuff, you know. And uh, so he warned me that you, you have a tough crowd, you know. And anyway, so I spent uh, the first part of the, the day explaining to them the kerygma, Jesus. And, the and I said, yeah, to the priest, I said, and I'm making no assumption that any of you know who Jesus is in a personal way. You're not saying they don't, but you're not saying they do. Yeah, I'm you're making just, no assumption. We scratch. often make yeah. the assumption that people do know. Yeah. And we assume that everyone's going to, you know, into heaven. It's an assumption. We should, it, there should be no assumption. So I, I warned them, and, but I, I communicated to them who Jesus was and, um, and his invitation to be in personal relationship with him. So after, you know, about three or four hours of that presentation of the kerygma, I took them into the chapel and then I communicated to them in a very clear way that if you feel that you've never you know, had a conversion, uh, if, if you've never opened up your heart, as St. Benedict talks about, that, uh, you know, at the heart of Christianity is a relationship, an encounter with a person that brings about conversion. If you feel that you haven't had that conversion, if you don't know Jesus personally, um, I'm going to invite you uh, to come forward, and we had Jesus, uh, you know, in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and I, I'm going to invite you to come and out loud give your heart um, to Jesus and place him at the center of your life. I had no idea how this would respond. I mean, these are priests, you know, like, I mean, they've discerned their vocation, you know, they've given their life to Jesus. And I sat down, just prayed, and, and very quickly, one by one, these priests stood in front of Jesus, their arms open wide, and with their voices speaking out loud, a commitment to place Christ at the center of their lives. And then sitting down, and then the next priest, the bishop, all the priests went forward and gave their lives to Christ. Now, the reason they're able to kind of know that this is important is because it was communicated in a very clear and simple way that I could say, ultimately, have you ever had this experience? Mm. Is it possible that, I'm just wondering, did all of them go up? Did, Every one of them. So is it possible that they've had that experience before, but they're recommitting? Is that possible? The, uh, and I, I explained that. I explained yeah. that. Some of you, for the very first time, some of you have had this experience. Thank you for that question. Um, and uh, I never stopped and, and invited right. him to talk about, you know, if this is first or second time. Right. But they, they approach it as if it was the very first time in their lives. And um, to me, that when we talk about evangelization, when we talk about really um, engaging and, and inviting people to this encounter, that decision of faith is extremely important. It's beautiful. You, you give them the opportunity to make that decision, right? The, to make that declaration, which I think is one of the most powerful elements of what you did there, was like you you, you give the space for someone to to recommit to to, to express that both internally but also externally. I, I had a I yesterday I was on a phone call with uh, Das and director because what we sent this book to um, to every um, a Das and director of evangelization in America. Sweet. So we sent out 250 books and we've received a lot of um, uh, um, emails and, and phone calls um, and wanted to ask more about the book. But I got one, uh, I'm not going to mention which diocese, but um, they ordered um, two boxes, which would be 140 uh, books. And so I needed to call them and find out why they were doing this. And, 
And so I was in a conversation. We spent about an hour talking about the book. And um, I said, why, why, why are you ordering these books? What, what is it that, that captured you? And um, she said, she goes, um, I've always known that the kerygma is really important. And I've not always known conversion um, was important, but I didn't know the two had, they were connected, meaning Jesus was connected to conversion. Mm -hmm. Now you, you would say, what? <laughs> you know, what? Jesus is not connected to conversion because their understanding of conversion is an experience of faith. So it could happen, you know, you're, you're, uh, if you just have a even a beautiful liturgy, it can be an encounter um, that Jesus is not necessarily kind of explicitly communicated. Um, so, you know, people want to create those conditions for a, mm. a really beautiful encounter. But she didn't recognize that Jesus was essential to that, that encounter. It's, it's a conversion to Christ. And um, she said, I, I always knew that, but you're able to put it in such, you're bringing the connection the centrality of Jesus, the conversion. Right. Um, and it's so, um, again, confusing for so many people. So Andre, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for, for coming and joining us and, and telling us a little bit about your book, Clear and Simple, How to Have Conversations That Lead to Conversion. If people want to find this book, uh, where, where, where do they get it? They just have to go to cco.ca in our store. And it'll be there for the taking. Um, Excellent. For the Americans, we have um, we can get it to you. We have we work with St. Joseph Communication. I think um, they can get it uh, in our American distributor. So, so. I, I'm I'm halfway through, Andre, and I, I haven't. I mean, what I can say is the first half has been excellent. I've really, really appreciated it. And so, for people who are listening, uh, you know, especially pastors and teams, I think there's a lot of wisdom in this book that would help equip them to have conversations with with friends, colleagues, parishioners, people going through programs at the parishes to help mm -hmm. them have the conversation both clearly and simply yeah. and, and to express the kerygma in a way that might be able to yeah. help bring people to, to Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I would love to, to, um, to invite people to, you know, just take a stab at it, just read it because um, yeah, I just, invite you to go to And if people want to, because because Catholic Christian Outreach is such an amazing ministry, I'd love for, if people want to learn more about it, where would they find information about Again, CCO? Again, cco.ca. Um, you know, everything we have is is there. If you have any questions, you can, you know, contact myself or my wife, but there's a lot of people you can contact if you have any questions about who we are and what we're doing. Excellent. Thanks so much for all the work you do on campuses and, and, and yeah. indeed here and around the world. Yeah. You're, you're, I'm just... It's such an important ministry. And for those of you who are joining us, perhaps you think our ministry is at least somewhat important. Maybe not as important as CCO, but, oh. but, but, uh, but look, if, 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 if you want to do something to support the ministry, uh, here, let, me, let me issue a challenge and an opportunity for you to take a, a moment out of your day to help support Divine Renovation as we try to have impact on, on people and parishes. Oh, I, I encourage you to try and share it. Just share this podcast. Uh, share it over social media. Share it by word of mouth, by email. Uh, we want to we want to grow our impact as much as we can, and so you are a key element in how that can happen. So if you feel the call to support this ministry, let, let me say that, that sharing it, reviewing it, is, is one of the one of the ways that you can really help us. So thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Okay.